think so. I made over 130 podcasts over the last 12 years. Um, and uh, I've made every mistake in the world about how to make podcasts. And I often come and tell people about, not only about podcasts, but some of the things I've learned over the years as far as like, what makes things work and not work? For a lot of people, especially from traditional media, um, podcasting is very confusing because it seems so similar, yet it's so different than what they're used to doing. So we'll look at this question, and there is an answer to this question. Um, first, just to let you know, when I was at NPR, I created, I, I, I started podcasting at NPR about 12 years, 13 years ago. And um, I myself created a number of podcasts, including TED Radio Hour, Invisibilia, and Ask Me Another, or three. And when I was at Audible, I oversaw all the, the original content that Audible cre created. In addition, I created several myself, uh, including The Butterfly Effect with John Ronson, Sincerely X, which was my second collaboration with Ted, uh, sh Where Should We Begin with Esther Perel, and West Cork, which I understand is a much bigger deal here than it is in the United States. It was very popular in the United States, but I understand it was much, like every t person I met, they're like, oh, this guy created West Cork. They're like, oh, OK. So. Um, uh, and, and coming here is a lot of fun for me because uh, even though Newsom doesn't sound like it, my, my, dis, my, um, my ancestors are Irish. And yesterday, the first thing I did when I got here is went to the Newsom Brothers building, which is actually on Pierce Street right out here, just, just down about a block. So I'm very excited to be here. It feels like coming home after 300 years, right? Okay, so uh, moving on. Uh, in my office for 22 years has been this picture, and can you, you know who this picture is? Uh, so there's a clue on there. His name is on there. It's Ziggy Pop. <coughs> it's a cover from a very unremarkable album, but I have this framed hanging above my desk because it looks down at me like telling me you're not trying hard enough, and uh, uh, I have it there as inspiration for me. And and one of the very uh, there are hundreds of interesting things about Iggy Pop, but the one that's really relative to me in my work is his hatred of broccoli. He hates broccoli so much that he will, uh, if you Google Iggy Pop broccoli, you will see a YouTube video when he was on the David Letterman show with a head of broccoli around his neck because he hates it so much he wanted to keep it there for inspiration. And uh, some of his tours, contract writers, including having a bowl full of broccoli that he can throw on the floor before he walks out to perform to inspire him. So I have my own version of Iggy's head of broccoli. And it is another picture that has hung by my desk for many years. And it is a picture of Richard Branson. <laughs> now, I'm sure Richard Branson is a very nice guy. It has nothing to do with him. The reason I keep a picture of Richard Branson next to my desk and have for years is last year, Richard Branson was a guest on over 30 different podcasts. And I never want to be the guy who's creating things that's like the 31st interview with Richard Branson. Right? You know what, he, what Richard says differently in all those different podcasts? Nothing. They're all identical. They're all exactly the same. But he's easy to book. And for him, podcasters aren't going to ask tough questions, so he always goes on podcasts to talk about things. And so you just see him. In fact, it was more than 30 times. I just got depressed and stopped counting at 30. But it was more than 30 <coughs> different times. And I want to make sure that as a creator, I am never creating things that are like that 31st interview with Richard Branson. Right? So, which brings us to the question for this conversation, um, and you'll see how all this kind of comes together in, in the end, I promise it does. Um, are podcasts the new radio? Because you see, you know, in the United States, podcasting is it's very exciting now. It's a $350 million a year industry in the United States. It was a, maybe a, a zero industry 10 years ago. Um, and it's forecasted by 2020, which is just two, less than two years from now, to go up to 600 million in revenue from the podcasting industry. Now, that seems very impressive until so you look at in the commercial radio industry in the United States is billing $19 billion. So how come podcasting is getting all this F energy, all this attention, and all this, um, uh, you know, which is so outsized to what its econo actual economic impact is? It's because podcasting really is the future of on-demand radio, full stop. And when people ask questions like, is podcasting the new version of radio, I answer, yes. But it's actually, the answer is kind of. And the reason that, is, that I hedge that is it depends how you define radio. Now, this is a copy of my iTunes library. And there's something that I think tells a lot about the future of the audio industry 
that's hidden inside this. It's right over here where it says Internet Radio. It's an option inside of iTunes. If you go to that list under Internet Radio, there are thousands of radio stations. If you look at the icon, the icon is actually a tower with beams coming out of it. But you know what the amazing thing is about that listing? If you look at those thousands of radio stations, very few of them are FM broadcasters. Almost none of them are FM broadcasters. Yet to the people creating and to the people receiving it, they consider it radio. So if, when I talk to radio groups, I talk to people who are, are, are comfortable and familiar with the radio ecosystem, I tell them that radio has transitioned in the mind of listeners from being a technology to being an experience. It feels like the radio. It sounds like the radio. It doesn't matter if it comes from an FM broadcaster. So when people nervously ask me about the future of radio, I tell them, if you believe that radio is FM broadcasting, your future is going to be diminished and diminished and diminished and diminished. However, it is a perceptual slight turn to think of it not just being FM radio, but being on smart speakers and being in podcasting and being in streaming and being on whatever chip they insert in your head in, in a year or two, right? If you think you are creating an audio experience, then radio, when Mike Gruz are sitting around and we're talking about making things at Audible, nothing ever appeared on FM radio, and yet we still talked about what we were doing <laughs> as making radio. Because to us, it's exactly the same. One person who sees podcasting as an existential threat. One person sees it as a massive opportunity. And the only difference is their definition of radio. So is it the future of radio? Sure. Or it could be the, the, the end of it. So there are four, to understand podcasting and understand why there's so much momentum behind this, even though dollar-wise it's so much smaller, um, at least in the United States, um, there's four numbers that are very important to understand. 600, 100, 18.5, and 2,000. 600 is there are 600,000 podcasts available today. 600,000. When I started podcasting at NPR in 2005, it was the same year that Apple started putting podcast listings inside of iTunes, and there were 3,000 in there. Um, there are 100 different languages of content. 18.5 is the 18.5 million episodes of content. And 2,000 new podcasts a week. That means while you're sitting here this morning, there'll probably be about 45 podcasts at the end of this meeting that weren't there at the beginning of this meeting. It is a fast moving, fast, it's so fast moving that I started using this template for this talk a year ago. This number was 500,000, this number was 16, and this number was 1,000. That's how fast these, these things are changing here. So there's a lot of content. So whenever I sit down with people and we say, hey, we got an idea for a podcast. You know, I work as a consultant now. I am available for hire, by the way. I've got <laughs> lots of business cards in my pocket. Um, uh, the, uh, when people come to me, they're like, hey, I want to make a podcast. I always start the conversation with one question. It should, why should there be 600,001? podcasts. Because in a crowded space, it is so hard to get attention. Podcasting was founded to be a completely open and democratic space where anyone can come in. The barrier to entry is incredibly low, but that doesn't mean that the barrier for success is incredibly low. It's very, very hard to get a podcast that becomes economically sustainable. And people just say, assume because it's easy to get in that they're just going to throw something in there and it's going to do great. Well, that's a, that's a myth. We'll talk about some other myths here too. So I have four myths of podcasting I always talk about with people when they're talking about podcasts. And um, it's amazing how often, like in any day when I'm doing consulting with clients, how many times I talk about each of these. So the first one is, I'm going to make a million dollars or a million euros for my podcast, right? Everybody hears about all these dollars coming in and the people are making all this money and the costs are so low. And I think you take almost any industry and find people who become very wealthy in it and a lot of people who don't. There are, there are publishers or, or authors who make a million euro a year, and there are lots of authors who don't. There are farmers who make a million euro a year, and there are a lot of farmers who don't. There are interior designers who make a million euros a year, and there are lots who don't. Podcasting is no different. So if your company or your 
talent or people you work with and thinking this is a huge, we're just going to be cash and checks every day. Could happen, but it's the wrong reason to get in podcasting. The second is a podcast is only 20 or 30 minutes. I've got 20 or 30 free minutes. I can make a podcast. I hear this every day from talent. I was having a conversation just last week with a, a woman who's incredibly well-known, really passionate about this idea she has for a podcast. And we started talking, and she said, OK, so the podcasts I like um, are, are about 30 minutes long. And I've got 30 minutes, so we can kind of fit this in between lunch and my, my, my uh, some interview I have at 1.30, right? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I said, Show me, tell me an interview that, or, or podcast that you like. And there's one of mine that she really liked, which is why she came to me. And um, I said, that podcast, that host, first, that half-hour interview you heard took about two hours to record and then was edited down. And then that host spent about 15 hours preparing for that, two full days. So I said, it's basically like a half, half of your work week we're going to produce in that one 30-minute episode. And used to say, we didn't set a second appointment. Right? So it takes a lot of time to do something well. Now, you can go in and hit record and talk and, and hit stop and post. And you, know, you and I could go in the other room and have a podcast up in less than an hour. Right? We could. Right? That doesn't mean anybody's going to listen to it. Nothing, no, nothing, I'm sure you're a fascinating person. But um, uh, the, there's, it's, uh, you, the amount of effort put in is equal or proportional to the amount you get out of it. Another myth is it's only audio. How hard can it be? I hear this all the time from people in the movie and, t and TV industry of like, oh, but it's like, it's like what we do, but you don't have to worry about the video part of it, which is what all the, you know, it's true that I could, with my backpack, carry everything I'd ever need to record a podcast, right? Uh, compared to a truck you would need to record a movie or a TV, even for a, for a light crew. Um, it, it is true that it requires less equipment, and it is true that the production costs are less, but uh, anyone in the room who has ever worked in audio will tell you that audio storytelling is just as hard. The absence of video doesn't make it easier. It actually makes it somewhat harder to do. So whether it's a conversation or whether you're producing a feature, um, you know, which is like a narrated story or, or a narrative story, um, it takes a lot more work than you think. And the other myth, which I, which I hear all the time, is, oh, we're just going to record this. We're just going to put it out there. Because, you know, all these podcasts, people put them out there. You hear about someone in their garage putting together a podcast, putting it out in the next year. They're on tour, uh, going to live events, making, catching their million dollar checks, and have a book deal and a TV option deal. And that does happen, but out of 600,000 people, you could probably count on a couple hands um, the number of people who've had that actual experience. Putting, it's not just, I, I, one of the reasons that I feel I have been successful. Uh, when I've been successful, which is not all the time, um, has been because I've thought about content and marketing as, as equals in a creative process, that the, or editorial and marketing, that creating something great makes no sense if you have no idea how you're going to get it in front of an audience. And you have to have a message that carries through the editorial into the marketing so that people are able to, you know, you can create this great work of art, but if nobody <laughs> understands it or can figure out what it is, what's the point? Right? I also don't think the podcasts are art either, which is which we'll, we'll uh, um, which we can talk about later if you wish. So um, I, so one of the things that I I have looked at, I spent a lot of time looking at my own podcasts and the podcast work of others, trying to find out what common elements are you see inside of successful podcasts, and whether it's a conversation program, an interview, a narrative piece like This American Life or Radio Lab, um, or West Cork. Um, there are three things that all good podcasts have in common. They're story, character, and voice. And I'll briefly run through what each of these mean. Story is a compelling story or idea. Everything has to be about something. And you have to go through the work of defining it and then keep sticking to your vision. My friend Heather has a podcast called Whiskey Cats. You know, it's her and two of her friends. They sit in a room. They hit record. They have a bottle of, of, of whiskey, and they drink the whiskey, they finish the bottle, and you listen to them slowly get drunk. That's basically what the podcast is. It's not a huge podcast, right? But that's all they do. They talk about whiskey, and they talk about cats. That's all they do, right? And people have suggested, maybe you could try tequila, or you could go branch out into like fruit cocktails or something like that. And they're like, no, we talk about whiskey, and we talk about cats. And their guest every week is a bottle of whiskey, and they should talk about what the funny things their cats did. 
That's all it is. Now, for people who listen to it, you know what you're getting when you get that. It's a little bit of an extreme example, but you know what you're getting when you sit down in a world of 600,000 things. You can't just say, this is the blah, 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 and expect someone to understand what that is or care. You have to tell them what it's about. Every successful podcast has done that in some degree or another. And I should also say, my, my, my litmus test for success is not financial success. It's not downloads. You define what your audience is, and if you can successfully reach that audience, you are successful. I know a guy um, who has a, real, uh, a podcast for real estate agents in Northern California because they have some specific things about their market, and all he cares about is reaching that group. He doesn't care about anybody else. So if he reaches them, and that's a couple hundred people, he's successful. You know, TED Radio Hour, which is one of the things I created, is downloaded 15 million times a month, right? That's a different definition of success, but they're both equal. When I talk about success, you're, are, you hitting, are you reaching the audience you want to? So, uh, so one of the ways I always tell people to force them to describe their ideas in 10 words or less in a way that describes it and nothing else in the world is a great exercise. I usually do that in like a workshop with people for a couple hours to figure out how, what it, are you that, uh, that is different than what the person next to you is. Um, and I also make uh, people, uh, this is, the, this is uh, all over the internet, you don't have to worry about copying this down. I make people describe themselves without using any of these words on this list. They can't describe themselves as brilliant, diverse, extraordinary, fabulous, tremendous, unbelievable, quality, remarkable, so on and so forth, because these words actually mean nothing. They describe nothing. So when people are thinking, when you think about your favorite podcast, how would you describe it? Chances are you can do a pretty clear job of it if it's been something that, that, that you've been listening to for a while. So uh, there's a great uh, a marketing book called Zag, and the guy's name is Maury, and it starts with an S, and I can't remember his last name, but I, uh, so I apologize for that. Um, Zag is, is basically like a, a real kind of zen look at marketing, which is, which is really an approachable, quick read. Um, and he talks about something similar, which is your onlyness statement. Like, our brand is the only blank that blanks. So if the first of that is our brand is the only podcast that blanks, what is that second, what is that second statement for the podcast that you, uh, you're creating or you're marketing? Uh, character is the other one, having an engaging character or host. The people in the podcast are people relate to. The, a lot of podcasting... Um, is either people having conversations or people telling stories. And the conversations uh, one is very important because the listener identifies with the people who are the, the host of the podcast. If you're a big, big Joe Rogan fan, I met somebody yesterday who was a huge fan of the Joe Rogan podcast because he loves Joe Rogan and wants to see how Joe Rogan looks at the world. Right? Um, Tim Ferriss is another. Oprah has a podcast now. I mean, like, that, that's that view of your view through that, like the real estate agent in Northern California who wants to know what that host is thinking or how that host is looking at things. Um, and, and also, when you're looking at uh, doing a narrative podcast, if you're a fan of narrative storytelling, the characters in that story are your avatars for your idea. So you have to have someone that's clearly engaging. Like if several of you mentioned you've heard Wes Cork before, it, uh, a lot of it focuses around a guy named Ian Bailey. I'm sure many of you are familiar with him. He, uh, and he is the, he and the murder victim in this are the two kind of avatars for our premise when we created that, which is that what makes West Cork such an interesting podcast is it's not about a murder. It's actually about the kind of com conflict between two different classes of people. And um, so that was our story idea, and then the characters had to reflect that idea. And then the last one is voice, um, uh, which is basically having a unique voice or a unique way of telling the story. Um, so many people, do, this is really about execution. This is really about um, what you bring to it as a creator and also the way that it is created. Again, a lot of people when they create a podcast will just stick a microphone in front, in front of them and hit record and just kind of blah, blah, blah into a... Um, uh, about whatever they're, they want to talk about. Bee, beekeeping, there's podcasts about that. There's beekeeps about, you know, there's uh, podcasts about quilting and every topic you can think of. And uh, if you're not bringing something unique to the way you're producing it, um, I think it just becomes very, very difficult for an audience to access. Uh, I was talking with someone the other week who had a podcast, can't remember what it was about. Um, I met him at a party and they're like very excited to tell me about their podcast. 
And she's like, what's one thing I can do to improve it? I'm like, where do you record it? She goes, in my kitchen. I was like, well, why don't you go outside? Why don't you go to the park? So it just sounds different. Instead of sounding as sterile, she's trying to make her, her kitchen sound as sterile as possible. I'm like, that's the exact opposite of what she'd be doing. Go out and live in the world and record your podcast out in the world. And it'll just have a completely different energy and feel to it than it would be in your sterile kitchen. In fact, I have produced nothing in the last five, six years, with the exception of TED Radio Hour, which is half of it's recorded in a studio, but I've produced almost nothing that is based in a studio. Because you know, for years you're trying to create this perfect sonic environment, and I believe that things should be out in the world. So even for just reading copy, sometimes we'll stick people out in the world and have traffic around them and so on and so forth, because it just sounds better, it's more interesting to the ear. So um, when we're talking about the future of podcasting, so people are like always asking, what is next? I always tell people that the future of podcasting is that the podcasting element will become far less important to it. I personally hate that word. I think it sounds nerdy and geeky and techy and confusing and difficult to use, and it really is all of those things still. Um, there was uh, two things that happened in tw 2014 which kind of created the kind of surge or wave or tsunami of podcasting over the last five years. Um, those two events were the Apple iOS operating system in 2014 had um, built in the podcast app into the, into the basic operating system so you didn't have to download anything. It was just there on your phone. If you updated your phone, you had the podcasting app. And then six weeks later, a, 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 a podcast called Serial debuted. And Serial would have never been Serial if it wasn't for that 